everyone. I'm Vanessa from Lit Consulting, and you're listening to the Beyond the Model podcast, where we uncover the methods and mindsets of real estate's top producers. This week, we're interviewing Mark Pattinson. Mark is the CEO of Porchlight Realty in San Diego, California. This is a 70-person team that did $100 million in sales in the first quarter of 2023. Pretty impressive stuff. In this interview, we talk about a whole range of topics from recruiting new, new agents to the way he organizes his sales team and so much more. I'm so excited to share this with you and we're going to get right into it. But I just want to remind you, if you are looking to build your legacy in real estate, this is a podcast you're going to want to follow. So make sure to hit that subscribe button and follow along for tools, resources, and inspiration to help you build your legacy in real estate. All right, let's get into it. Well, hey, Mark, thanks for sitting down with us. I really appreciate it. I always like to start with people's origin stories because I think it's so interesting to hear about where somebody started and, and how they got where they are today. So how did how did Porchlight get started? Yes, so I, I was an agent, solo agent when I got into the business. Quickly joined a team because being on a team was much easier than trying to figure it out all on my own. I was a buyer's agent for this team for maybe about a year. And then underneath the team, I created my own little group. That's kind of where Porchlight originated. So I had only been an agent for two years and I decided to start a team. Team. So I feel very bad for all those agents that I had in the beginning. Some of them was still with me, which is kind of funny. Uh, actually two, two are still with me from those OG days. And we started out and it was not called Porchlight. It was just like a group underneath of uh, another team. And then we slowly bigger. We are now, I believe right around like 70 agents, but more or less 45 agents are in production. There's just because there's always new people coming in trying to get on. I uh, and, and before real estate was really just bouncing around in careers and not sure what I wanted to do. Kind of landed on real estate, which I've stayed with because I think it's that is so exciting is there's always something new. And I think I always got bored with the regular traditional career choices. Uh, working at a corporation was not my cup of tea. So real estate's definitely my game. It's a lot more entertaining for me. And then that's kind of how I started. And I don't know where we're going to go, but we'll see. Yeah. You have too much energy to just sit behind a desk and do one thing every day. I, you, you've got to be doing, you have to have your hands in multiple things, don't you? Yes. I'm trying to slow that down a bit because it's like, it all comes back to time. Yeah. And if you can't allocate enough time to it, it just doesn't work. So I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Cause like I get approached so much constant that it's like, all right, I gotta, I gotta protect that a little bit only because I can't really give the full me if it's, if it's uh, not, if the time doesn't allocate. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So you said 70 ish agents and how many offices yes. or how are they distributed? Yeah. So I have one office right now, I have another office in probably October. So I bought another building and we're building out a coffee shop. So it's going to be porch light coffee in the front and then real estate in the back. So it's like a, a coffee shop, real estate and bullet. Uh, yeah. So we'll have Love that it. in the front and the back <laughs> will be all real estate. So it's, it's set up on like, and it's called porch light coffee. So we'll have that. If that model works, I'm going to end up probably expanding that all around. The problem mm -hmm. is that I encounter is I want to own everything. I don't want to rent. Anything. So I'm like, well, I want to buy another building for another coffee shop, but that's like, you know, 25% down or 30% down. And then I got to remodel it. I'm like, Every time I do one of these, it's like 400 grand, 500 grand. Yeah. Doing yeah. it back to back. Yeah. So, so is that that's where be, I get stuck. Is that going to be party in the front and business in the back? Is that a reverse mullet? Yeah, it's a reverse mullet. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever seen the Capital One cafes? I don't know. No, the no, no. They're, they're like, they're like white and blue and red. So like red, white, and blue colors. And they are doing these cafes all around the country. And it's basically like a coffee shop kind of like loungy and then in the back they have these like cubicles for their employees for capital one and they essentially are like using it as a lead provider but the cool thing about it is if you use a capital one credit card to pay it's 50 percent off oh, always nice so it's like free coffee well you're paying half but like they're probably not making a ton of profit on that but they're just getting that that it's they're creating, yeah well, and also they're creating like a, a culture so it's not bad. And I, I think it's Pete's Coffee. I think is the coffee shop is Pete's Coffee. They white label it Capital One Cafe. 
name recognition everywhere. And that's what Porchlight, I essentially think if, if I had five of these coffee shops around town, people would meet my agents randomly on maybe an online lead and they'd be like, oh, I've heard of that brand. Oh, Porchlight Coffee. Oh yeah, we go there all the time. Oh yeah, it's actually the same owner. It's very smart because like I'm, I'm telling right now with my coaching clients, I'm leaning in going, you guys, real estate is a lifestyle business. Like layer it into your lifestyle. Stop pretending that everything that you're doing on the weekends and this and that, like you can't, you can loop real estate into that. And you think about yeah. this coffee shop idea, it's brilliant because first of all, it's coffee. There's a Starbucks on every corner. People like add some competition, right? But then it's culture. It's a vibe. People will hang out and chill. They'll come yeah. in and they'll talk. It's a no brainer. And especially how much room do you really need for a coffee shop, right? 1000 square feet. That's it's like, it's a total lead generator that people were just going to walk in. Yeah, I got to figure out a way is like, is it just to play the brand so that it's recognition or how do I incorporate? Because there will be a section that is the real estate office in the back. I don't want to have like listing signs. And things. I do think like there's a coffee shop called Alfred's in LA and their sleeves on their coffee cups always change. But the reason why they change is because they sponsor like their, their sleeves are going to be sponsored by like a Netflix show. So if Netflix or someone else has like a new show coming out, They'll sponsor the sleeves. And so I was thinking, what if Porchlight Realty sponsored Porchlight Coffee Sleeves? And that was like our way to kind of put in the branding, but not have it be tacky. Like, I don't want it to be like, oh my God, if you go to that coffee shop, real estate agents are going to like talk to you and it's annoying. I don't want that at all. Right. Uh, yeah. I want it to be like, you can see it, but it's not really like the focus. I think that we could probably have a minimum five because the model, I mean, you could, you can add as many coffee shops as you want. But I think that five in, in key areas around the county would be huge. And then something where is if you're part of the Porchlight family, when you buy a home, you're part of the Porchlight family or you sell a home, you then get maybe a blue card or something that that is kind of a 50% a off card at our coffee shops. Mm -hmm. uh, and when they you know, and maybe we send a monthly thing of beans to their house, you know, if they're, are you a coffee lover? Yes or no. And then we just like, if we're roasting our beans, because it costs us nothing to package something up and send them beans for free every month. The beans are, that's a great idea. Beans every yeah. month, all day long, right? Branded to- Yeah, we're talking about a nurture. Yeah. Yeah, all day long. I love that. So do you see yourself, like, is it open? Is the coffee shop open to the office in the back? So agents can kind of chill, hang out, use space. That yeah, kind of we're going to have, uh, I was originally going to do something like glass, I, it's not modern. It's more like earthy. So it, we were going to do something like glass, but maybe like the New York city, you know, the square glass with the black frame, multiples, kind of like a warehouse glass. We we're going to do something like that, but now I'm thinking more of like a breezeway block. So those are the older blocks from the, you know, the 50 and again, the eighties, now the 2030s. Yeah. Or 2020, 2020s. What year are we in? Yeah. So now the breezeway blocks are back and they're cool. So I'm thinking about doing that to separate the space. So like you can see back there, but it's not like part of the same room. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. And you have the space un under construction right now. Yes. Yeah. Nice. That's so we don't we don't we don't have any other offices in any other places. Okay, no offices, but you have teams in other places, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. and we have rental offices, places that people use, but a lot of the a lot of the teams end up being just remote. So for example, our top agents, I'll look and see, I think our top five that we have currently, I don't even know if any of them even come into the office. So it's kind of funny. An office is nice, but a lot of them don't even come. Of the top five, only one of them comes in every day. The other ones rarely come in. So, and that would be to your, your current location, obviously in North Park. And of the current location in North Park, all of them live close except for one. They should be coming in, but not really. I mean, they, if they're producing, it doesn't really matter. So yeah. office isn't necessarily a thing for real estate. Whereas like there's other people that are, you know, they're in every day. Like number seven is in three times a week. Number six is never in. Number eight is in there every day. Number nine has been in the office probably twice. It's kind of funny, right? Like yeah. it's back and forth so whether someone comes in or not. It's just up to what they look for. Yeah. So what, in a, on an average daily basis, what is your office? What's the vibe in your office? Who is there? Who comes uh, in? Usually about five dogs. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there's always dogs at our office. My operations manager. 
So my like admin staff, my assistant, our marketing department manager, our interns will be there Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So we do an intern program with San Diego State University. And we rent out our office spaces. So it's kind of like a WeWork. So we have quite a few vendors that rent office space from us. So there'll be any given day, you know, like three different loan teams in there, marketing, like another marketing company that's outside of my marketing company rents an office from us. Okay. So it creates this vibe. It, there's always someone there, but the, the agents are probably not the most there. Well, I like that though. First of all, you're leveraging it, offsetting your expenses, but also the bodies and having that vibe in there. Again, oh yeah. And there's at least 30, 30 people there at any given time every day. So, and there are different vendors, different people from different businesses. That's crossover and referral business. Obviously that's why you're doing it. I imagine, right? That's yep. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. So I heard staff, you have operations manager, assistant, sounds like marketing person. Tell me about like your org chart of your, of your team, of your organization. There you go. That was it. That's it. So it's you. I have uh, a transaction coordinator. Okay. So it's you, a TC, yep. an admin, like your like your main admin, yep. assistant, marketing person, right? And it's just you as far as leading the team goes, right? There are squad leaders. So they're not on W2 or anything, but what they are, they're incentivized through their squad. So essentially like say Vanessa and Ryan, your agents on my team and say, I'm the squad leader you would be in my squad and I would get a cut of the deals that you do in relation to the lead that I'm doing. So it's my job to basically make sure that watch what you're doing. And the squads will have up to 15 agents on a squad because one agent can monitor about 15 above that. It gets a little too much for them. So say you two are on my squad and say Ryan's conversion drops a little bit and I have 10 spots for the bench or 10 spots for my team. And there's maybe two newbies that I see more potential in. I'd be like, hey, Ryan, you're on the bench. Hey, newbie, you're in. Prove yourself because you got one month to do some work. If not, Ryan gets his spot back. So they can run it however they want. They can kick anyone off their squad at any time. I don't monitor it. I don't want to hear about it. If you're an adult. You make money off this. Let's go. Okay. I love this. So you took your 70 agents, right, that you have on your team, and you're breaking them up into squads. Yep. So squads we have like Zillow, for example, we had 45 agents on Zillow Flex. We had to, we have to monitor that on the regular. So there's three squad leaders for Zillow Flex. For Veterans United is another lead source of ours. We have 15 agents on, we have one squad leader for that. For Realtor.com, we have six agents on it. We have one squad leader for that. For Open Houses, that's a newer agent kind of thing. We have 10 agents on that. There's one squad leader. So any open house deal, that they get, which we're going to start getting more of the open house stuff again. That's on my million list of to do things, but I want a squad leader on open houses. That's just going to like absolutely crush it with, with this way. I want to do it. Cool thing is it's, it's free. So that's why I want to do that. Wow. Okay. This is like the coolest thing I've heard in like a minute, the squad leader side, because here's the deal with, with any size team leader, that main agent right? They're the lead generator. They're the, the leader of the team, manager of the people. They're opening other businesses and coffee shops and all the things. So you're playing through other talented salespeople and you're incentivizing them. Yeah. And, and saying, Hey, I want you to run it, like do it, go like make them, you know, get them to in production and you're giving them the ability to swap those people out. How much of a role in your success in your team do you think that that plays the squad leader. Well, I mean, it's all about management. Think about how corporations are divided up. Do you have the CEO, say Starbucks is, you know, when Howard Schultz was the CEO, was he going and visiting all the stores and opening them every day and training his baristas? There's 14,000 stores, right? Impossible. Well, he had it broken up by districts, by states then probably by like districts within the United States. And then there was a VP and then there was the president and then him. Like, so it kind of just all, on, and it's all this way, all the way down. So that's the same way as us, except for it's really agents, squad leaders, operations manager, me. Yeah. I and are you it. still in well, production I, yourself? 
a little bit. I'll take like past clients and friends and referrals that are like that. You know, if it's like a referral, like, oh, they're not sure where they want to live. And I, I don't have the time to really dedicate to that. So it's, it would be like, hey, I have a client who wants to write an offer. I'm like, okay, I can do that. So do, kind of uh, as a percentage, describe how you allocate your time. So how much of your time is spent in business management, like operations management? Is this how much is in therapy call? Is it no. therapy call, <laughs> right? <laughs> I don't know how I spend my time. I'm like, where did my day go by? <laughs> No. So, okay. So one thing that I want to do, something I talked about before we jumped on the call was the conference I went to. And I've known of this, it's not a new tactic, but it's writing down what you spend your time on every 15 minutes. Yeah. Week that I'm back in the office, I'm going to set a timer on my phone to go off every 15 minutes for a week. And every 15 minutes, I'm going to jot down what I'm doing in that time. And I'm going to do that and monitor just see because time is so valuable when you are doing this. I think it's super important. One, if you want to be successful is waking up very early because a lot of people are not up at the same time that I'm up it, or, you know, other successful people. It allows you to kind of be a, your alone time, whether you're meditating, exercising, or even starting your day with work. You can get a lot of projects done before you start getting the pings of like, hey, hey, what about this? What about that? I get that all day long. So if I have that time in the morning, it's kind of my special time. So that's, that's really what I focus on. That's probably about two hours of just really hashing out the most important things that I for sure know are need to do. I also color coordinate my calendar. So I, anything that's red is something that I have to be somewhere or I have to be on a call or something that can't be moved. So if it's in red, can't be moved, there should be a link in there for Zoom or whatever it is, or a phone number. If it's a showing or a listing, same thing, it'll have the address of the listing. So my phone, hey, you need to leave in 12 minutes to get to this place in time. It helps out with, with making sure you stick to your schedule. Anything that's green will be stuff that makes me money. Thing that's blue could be on my calendar. It could be moved around. So if it's something I want to get done that day, that's on my calendar. So I kind of use it as my to-do list, but if I don't get it done, then I move all the blue stuff to the next day. Okay. Yeah. So it sounds like you're good about leveraging your time. And I want to know how you utilize your assistant to make sure that you're maximizing how, you know, how you spend your day. Yes. Uh, having systems set in place. So for example, like the calendar thing. So if you have an assistant, start making things clear and concise of how things are supposed to be done so that when you are explaining it, it's, it's happening the right way. I don't think that I'm the best with assistance to be honest. Like, I think I could be a lot better about delegation. There's a book that I bought. It's uh, basically a business playbook of how to delegate. So I'm going to read that, but maybe I could get her to read that for me. No, <laughs> give me the notes. No. but the, yeah, give me the cliff notes. No, I want to read it. So there's a, but on that idea is like, I need to, I need to be better about, but we use Trello for all of our projects. So every quarter we break all of our goals down into rocks, three rocks per person on my team per quarter. So with the admin and my, you know, with my assistant and with everyone else, everything that we do, if it's not part of those three, like if it's a little task, it needs to be moved to the next quarter, unless you're done with your three tasks for that quarter. Otherwise, it's like new idea, new idea, and you don't ever end up executing. So as long as you're, you have a place to throw all of your ideas and you have a place to throw all your processes, we document all of our stuff in Google Drive. So everything that you do has an SOP. Even if it seems simple, it needs to have an SOP because if you die today and I have to come in and step in in your place, I need to know how to do absolutely everything. For example, I own a short-term management company called 31 Beaches. So if you ever want to come down to San Diego and visit 31beaches.com, it's 31 beaches because there's 31 beaches in San Diego County. My guy who runs it's like, well, it's easy to change the photos. I go, it's easier for you because you change the photos all the time. You have to act as if this is the second grader coming in and changing the photos. So I have everything. Like everything do that. That I truly think. So when you do assign something to an admin, he or she, first thing they do, if they do it, they just type in SOP for it. And if it's in your Google Drive, it should pop up. If it's not in there and they write back, they're like, hey, I'm not sure how to do this. I couldn't find an SOP. You say, okay, this is how you do it. And then they know they create an SOP for that then. But then the next person, if it's them or whomever, they look it up, it's in there. Mark, you are speaking wow. my language. <laughs> I'm over here going, yes, 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 yes. Because you're right. Like you can't build a business to the size and the level of quality and consistency that you've built without documenting everything and making that just par for the course. 
everything new that happens gets documented. And then we have to go back sometimes and double check. Is that, does the system still work that way? Or do we need to update the SOP? If everybody would just start like that from the very beginning, their, their business trajectory would be so much more smooth. But usually we get to this point where the wheels are coming off the bus and then we're like, oh shit, we should probably document this stuff. <laughs> and then it's this whole process to go backwards and do it, right? So good for you for recognizing how important that is. I just wish, I hope everybody hears you say that and, you know, takes it to heart. No, yeah, yeah. The, I think that you have to empower others too. So when people say, oh, when I'm out on vacation, I get hit up, blah, 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 like constant. If you're empowering others, I don't think you'd probably have that issue. I do get texts occasionally, but like if I'm really gone, I just tell them like, hey, don't message me. They message me because it's like easy, simple things that they just want to like, they could wait till the next week. But it's like, you know, Mark, I know Mark's in Montreal, but he'll respond right now. It's not going to bother me. Was that a difficult process for you to let go and empower other people to handle things without checking in with you? I think this is, that's no, great. I don't, give a, so, I don't give a, I don't give a crap. <laughs> I don't want, yeah, I, my time, I, I don't have enough time to do everything that I want to accomplish. So you have to delegate. Yeah. And here's the thing. No one is going to be as good as you. If they're as good as you, then they'd be you and they wouldn't work with you or work for you. And not saying that my employees are not that way, but if you don't give them the power to make the decisions, you're constantly helicoptering them. And if they are good, they feel freaking annoyed at you. Oh yeah. And they'll leave. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like my agents and my people on my team are good. Like they are as good as me. If they're going to do it the exact same as you, it's like your one way that you think is the best could be amazing. Like a lot of my shit, not trying to toot my horn. I think things through. I always play the entire tape of how it's going to roll out. And like, what's, how are people going to be interested when we do this? Some people can't see beyond just one way. Play the whole tape. If you're good, that's great. But some people are going to be better at other things than you. Like you got to yeah. delegate that out. You yeah. know what I'm hearing in, in this is you have high, high standards and you have SOPs, you have structure, like you have expectations because I think a lot of agents out there that can, you know, throw anyone on their team and even talented people and maybe even keep them and give them a bunch of leads. But what's the culture like? Does it feel like a unit? Do they have a squad leader or are they off on their own struggling? And you know what I mean? And so I see you being able to scale because you have the standard. So you're not just kind of going, hey, take it. I don't want to deal with it. Go manage those people. I hired you for that job. You're helping and setting them up for success so they can keep that high standard because that's how you scale it to keep it the way you want the standards in place, right? So, but a lot of agents don't do that. They just scoop people in and then they kind of let them figure it out on their own. And there's this revolving door of them just leaving, but mostly lack of production, low energy, low culture, and no vibe, right? Like people are just leaving you all the time. So how's yeah. your retention? If me saying that, I'm sorry, you're going to say something. Oh, I said retention for sure. Like people will still leave no matter what, because say the market, for example, it just switched. It kind of got a little bit slow. When it gets slow, people think, you know, maybe it's not time to leave. Maybe they're already on their way out, but they were so busy. Maybe then they think, oh, this team is slower because agents may not know what's happening in the full marketplace, et cetera. So people are going to leave no matter what. We had the wrong hiring process for a while. We had the wrong person in charge of hiring. And they were hiring everyone that was nice and sweet, doesn't sell homes. You got to have the girls that want to rip people's heads off and will fight for their clients. That's a, And my, my team, there's people on there that are they're all the sweetest, but also it's like, you know that they're going to like, go to bat for their clients. That's who you need. You can't have a pushover. Uh, so that caused a lot of turnover in the fact that we got rid of them because we're like, hey, you're sweet. That's great. But you haven't sold a house and it's been six months. Yeah. Scared of the word no. Yeah. That, that was our fault for hiring. So we had a huge turnover last year slash the year before, but now it's been really minimal. So you do you think that you're on your team let's just say maybe the top five on your team, what do you think their behavioral styles are? Would you say they're DI? Uh, let me look. Okay, so number one, more analytical. Number two, stand 99D, 99I. Uh, number three is more passive. He's more of like kind of go with the flow. Number four is more go with the flow. Number five is analytical. Interesting. Interesting. 
Yeah, number one would probably be like a driver, but analytical. So like a D and I and a C. I think a lot of people, and if you're on a if you're on a team, you're more than likely a higher S, which you know you want to be a part of something. You want to be you know like majority of Americans are high S's. That's why corporations work so well. That's why military like military people are high S. They want to be told what to do. Mm -hmm. You're right. Yeah, most but, of the population. Uh, yeah, but on my team, I do give them a lot of freedom how they want to run their business. I don't helicopter parent. I also don't have time for it. I train them. Things need to be done a certain way. If you're coming out with marketing or whatever, it needs to be approved by me. Like I have systems in place, but I don't sit there and tell them like, you own, this is my way of the highway kind of mentality. Got it. Do they list and represent buyers as well? Yep. Okay. Yeah. So one of my agents, his first sale was a listing and he ended up doing 27 sales his first year. And he, I think 22 of them were listings or something. Wow. wow. So with that being said, if I didn't let him list, would he have ever got that for sale? You know? Nope. And I do sure. think that there's a lot, like I tell them, Hey, if you're doing a listing, your mentor needs to be listing certified. Like you need to go through listing certification, all the things, that, but still, even with education and that quick and they're brand new in the game, there's too much on listings. It's, it's just a lot to learn. Yeah. You you bring up a good point. Like, you know, if if I didn't let him take listings, would he even have gotten that, right? Like here he was 22 listings in his first year. No, he probably wouldn't have even came on your team. But I think there's a culture, I would imagine, in the way you speak to your team about their sales or what they do. You know, a lot of people call their team members just buy, buyer's agents. My buyer's agent, buyer's agent, buyer's agent. And I get that and there's nothing wrong with that. But I'm wondering if that comes with the mentality of only I take the listings, which in some teams that, that probably works, right? If they want it a certain way, but it, it's kind yeah. of my mind that you've got a new agent in his first year to listings. And it makes me think, is that because most people kind of treat the people that come on their teams as only buyers, you know, is yeah, it? And also he's a driver too. You know, drivers want to go for more listings. Definitely higher eyes want to go for more buyers. Ooh. Yeah. So yeah. you're, yeah. you're trying to make some personality of their career. And if you just let people be who they are, and it's so probably cool. going to be happier, more, well, yeah. Like be who you are and live your life, how you want to live and work, how you want to work. You're probably going to be happier. Yeah. Plus he buyer's can... agent also has like a negative connotation. You're like condescending. You're like, oh, yeah. you're a buyer's agent. There's two sides to every sale. Yeah. Buyers mm -hmm. are amazing. I love buyers. Mm -hmm. I think I have so yeah. much fun with buyers. If you don't like buyers, it's because you're a bad agent. Interesting. This is, you gave me a couple of nuggets that I'm like, this is interesting. I don't, I think the buyer's agent or the fact that you had a new agent come onto your team in 27 and do 27 deals, 22 listings. It all speaks to your leadership lid, you know, your ability to attract recruit, bring them on, help them, like creating space for that person to get 22 listings in their first year. That person coming into the business, especially being a driver, I imagine this is a sharp young man or whoever it is, woman. I don't know if you didn't say who it was. Eh, but he's a driver, but kind of a mess. <laughs> okay. But but he had to see that coming into the business that that Mark Pattinson had room for me to do listings on his team. Otherwise, he would have shied away from it. And I don't know. Well, no, he actually didn't even know the business. So he moved to our, he came to our team as a brand new. So that's the other thing is I take a lot of brand new agents. So he came not knowing really anything. I think that if I would have, if I would have hindered him from doing listings. So funny thing is he did that well on our team and he left after the first year. So oh. the reason being <laughs> new success, but this is what's great about it. New success is no matter how much I told him, put a, such a driver wouldn't listen, wouldn't listen, wouldn't listen. And finally, I started like really having talks with him. Like, dude, Put away money for taxes. I don't know what your bank accounts look like, but I know the way you're spending right now is way beyond your means. Sure enough, he got like a hundred and something thousand dollar tax bill and didn't have any money. So he quit our team because he said, Mark, I need to have a hundred percent of my deals, like of the leads I get because I'm so broke. I don't know if I'm ever gonna be able to get out of this tax bill. And I said, uh, cool. So he left. Well, the next year he sold nine deals total. And then 
what I looked so far, I think last year it was at like six. Wow. Yikes. So, so even, even though he was splitting with you on his team in that first year, oh, he, he still, still made more money. And the great thing about it is it's not about splits. In my opinion, it's about what you take home. It's about how you're prepped with taxes. It's about how you're prepped with what you should be doing with your money to make you more money. So my agents on my team, if you look at agents that have been on the team for X amount of years, I always take like the five-year mark. People who left because more than likely they wanted a better split versus the agents that stayed on my team. The net worth of every one of my agents that has been on my team for more than five years is way more than the people that left my team five years. But at the same level. So it's kind of crazy to think these people went for 100% and ended up their net worth is less than the people who went with something that they have a split with me. So that really speaks to your value proposition. So when you're recruiting agents, what's your pitch? Why should they join Porchlight? I don't pitch. You either want to come to Porchlight or you don't. I don't really care. <laughs> okay. So why would they come to Porchlight versus going on their own? There's, there's, a, there's a reason uh, you've outlined some of it. Yeah. I, I basically just say how much you want to make. So one thing is we don't discuss splits. If someone's concerned about splits, they're they're simple minded and they don't understand the value of what someone provides and how much it actually costs. Not someone I probably want on my team. What we do to discuss is I say, how much do you want to make? You know, have you been in real estate before? Yes, I have. Okay. So if you're concerned about splits, there's places down the street that offer a hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. Well, how does that look when you look at the agent sales? The average agent does about one to two deals a year at that company, but it's a hundred percent. But if you're brand new, I'm telling you right now, you'll probably get one deal. Maybe you'll start to luck. Maybe you're going to be a rock star agent. You'll get maybe six deals your first year. There's no one on our team that is going to be a good rock star that would only do six deals. That would be very, very, very hard. And when I'm telling you, when you do six, it's not enough to create skill, repetition, you know, that, 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 like kind of go getter mindset. But when you do 24, yes, you're getting a lower split, but that 24 just boom. Boom, boom. And pretty soon you don't have to prospect. Everything comes to you. After two years of being on our team, you don't have to be on leads. I mean, you don't have to be on leads from the start, but after two years, usually they give that up. So our path, I always say this, no matter what, real estate is like you're in you're in the ocean swimming. Now, the difference between our company, our team versus another team or another brokerage is that I'm going to point the direction of the island that you have to swim to. Now, are there still going to be sharks? Is there still going to be a storm? Is it still going to be hard as hell? Yes. But you have a direction. And I'm going to give you the tools to potentially create a boat. It's your job to create that boat. It's your job to get to that island. But at least you know that you have the directions and the instructions of how to. At the other companies, they're just going to say, good luck. You know, here's a phone in a phone book. And, you know, the olden days. And get calling. It's not going to be the same. You're not going to have the same outcome. And I guarantee your net worth will be more after five years than at this other company, no matter what your splits are. Okay, well, another one is, is that people, this is what I love about people when, if it's a brand new person and the entitlement thing does not go well for me. So I just get in the face right when it starts and it's like, well, you know, I think I really want to get, you know, so you, do you think you deserve more? And they and be like, okay, so explain why you deserve more. And then you, well, you know, I'm going to be the one doing the call. Okay. So did you get the lead? Cause it all starts at the lead. So where are you going to get your leads from? Well, I know, you know, X amount of people and be like, okay, so why would they use you over someone who actually knows what they're doing? Okay. Now, if you know what you're doing, okay. What page is the arbitration agreement and mediation clause on the RPA? Okay. What's this? Okay. Here's, here's the deal I'll make with you. I'm going to give you an exam. Do you score on this exam? is the percentage of what your split will be. If you deserve more, you'll make more because you know more. And that's how this industry works. It's all about grit, grind, and how much knowledge you have. So prove to me. We'll take the exam, whatever that split is, that'll be your split for six months. You can retake the exam in six months. Wow. Boom. And okay. they do it. not do well because they don't know shit and they don't deserve it. Yeah. I'm sorry, I worked my ass off for 10 years to become this. I deserve the money. You deserve to be an apprentice and work for free. I don't know where this entitlement, where you come into a new industry and you deserve more on your income. Yeah. Please explain to another, where else would you go that you walk into a job to apply for like a front desk position? Do you go and say, well, I deserve to be the VP of this company because 
you know, this front desk position just isn't going to fit for me. Well, I'm sorry, your front desk quality right now. Like that's, that's where you're at. You're not VP. Mm -hmm. You can get there for sure. And at least at my company, there's a path. A lot of companies don't have the path for you to go from front desk to VP. Right now you are a front desk on the ground running as an agent and that's your pay. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's a good analogy. I love that. Wow. Okay. All right, Mark, this was great. Thank you so much.